Hello and good morning or good evening, depending on where you are on the globe, uh, when you are where you are uh, connecting from. Um, this next uh, session is really close to my heart because uh, one of the one of the uh, presentations is about natural language processing, which was my trade for like over a decade, and we also. Uh, have a, a session about about uh, education, which is also one of my favorite topics. Uh, and uh, this uh, this is why it's uh, re really an honor for me to to be able to 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 uh, introduce uh, the speakers and presentations. And before we, I would like to introduce the first uh, presentation, which will be Rafał Jaworski uh, from XTM. Uh, he is an academic lecturer and scientist specializing in natural language processing techniques. His alma mater is Adam, Adam uh, University in Poznań, Poland, where he works at the Department of Artificial Intelligence. Rafał's scientific, uh, scientific work concentrates around developing robust AI algorithms for the needs of computer-assisted translation. These include automatic lookup of linguistic resources and computer-assisted assisted, post-editing. Apart from the research and teaching, he works as a linguistic AI expert at XTM International, leading a team of young and talented developers who put his visions at, and ideas into practice. And the um, standing natural language processing support for less resource languages with the use of word vectors and uh, the floor is yours, Rafa, and I, and I keep my questions to the end. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, Balas, for, for a very nice welcome to this, to this webinar, and welcome, everyone. It's, it's an honor to be able to speak to you about topics that are close to my heart, obviously, uh, because that's what I'm working on. Uh, so um, let's just get right into it. Uh, natural language processing. Right now, I feel that natural language processing is omnipresent in the localization industry. You get automatic dictionaries, automatic created dictionaries. You get a uh, querying of, of the dictionaries that it's done also automatically. You have translation memory lookups with all different sorts and flavors. Uh, usually, also, also can, can, can actually take a lot of um, from, from, from natural language processing. You've got automatic post-editing, you've got machine translation, you've got the lot. So uh, what I'm interested in actually right now is uh, what are your experiences with artificial intelligence in your projects? So uh, yes, so this is the, the, the poll. Thank you for, for, for that. Could you please take the time and just answer this, this simple question? Have you had any, um, have, uh, has artificial intelligence ever helped you in one of your uh, translation projects? I'm going to take the poll myself, and I'm quite honest with my answer. And I suppose you know what that what my answer was. But uh, am I able to to see the results of of, of the poll right now? Perhaps. Uh, oh. Yes. Oh, right. Yes. We can. Shall we give them like ten more seconds? Everybody, ten more seconds. Make sure you click submit, and then we'll share the end the polling and share the results. Of course, yes. And uh, yes. And sorry about not showing my presentation. It, uh, I'm, I'm I've clicked I clicked it right now uh, so it should be available in a few moments right i can see yes i uh, well we're in the process of sharing the screen so i hope everything will go fine uh right so so according to the poll results that we've just uh, seen uh, it seems that uh, a, a majority of people uh, has been using artificial intelligence, which is very heartwarming for me, and um, and that, that that that's very positive information. So, uh, what do you need to start with uh, natural language processing and with artificial intelligence? Well, uh, the best uh, best kind of resource that you can get to, to 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 do natural language processing is a bilingual dictionary, an electronic bilingual dictionary, but that's not always available. Uh, if it's got to get a bilingual dictionary, you could try to get a bilingual corpus, which is uh, like a translation memory, or um, it can be also automatically, uh, let's say, aligned. But still, it's um, uh, it's it's a series of translations of of sentences. And then, if it's hard to get that because you perhaps don't have access to any translations 
of, um, uh, of, of, of language you're working on, uh, then you can uh, just uh, try, try to get a monolingual corpus, which is possibly the uh, a resource that is most, uh, most likely for you to find. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. So we are talking about less resource languages. Less resource language is a language for which only a limited amount of language resources is available. Uh, the examples I'm giving here are, are some of the official languages uh, of India, but uh, the list of less resource languages is actually very broad. Uh, you, you can have uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of languages uh, on, on the list, and uh, there are some European languages on this also, and um, and well, I'm lucky enough as a Polish speaker that uh, th there are some resources available for my for, for my language, but I'm aware of languages for which the resources are very limited, and people who work with these languages uh, cannot possibly use natural language processing or artificial intelligence methods. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what can we do? Well, uh, we can try to do a word level alignment. So we can try uh, to, to do a task, natural language processing task, which, uh, which actually has a lot of potential because it can feed information to many other mechanisms. And the goal of word level alignment is to figure out what is the translation of a uh, words um, in, um, in the source language, which word in the type language is the translation of which word in the source language. As you can see in the, in the example, uh, this is the example of translating between English and, and French. It's not that, um, that obvious which, uh, which words should be translation of, uh, of which, uh, especially when we are talking about the, uh, the word implemented, right? Uh, but that's the problem. Uh, if, if we can solve the problem, then we can get going with NLP quite well. Next slide, please. Uh, so the idea is to use, uh, to dive into mathematics, to use so-called vector space that was invented uh, in Google Research Center in, well, back in 2013. And uh, they actually used uh, Google News Corpus to, uh, to produce uh, the, the, the vector space. They used neural network. They were uh, in interested in predicting the surrounding words based on the current words. But what's, mo what's most important about it is that they, uh, they landed with um, a database where they have had words represented by mathematical numbers. Actually, Actually, each word was represented by no less than 300 numbers. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, so, so that, that's the basic idea. We convert words to numbers and the numbers will now hold information about the word and the context of the word uh, in which the, the word appeared in, in, the, in the corpus. And why do we do this? Why do we convert words to, to numbers? Words were per perfectly fine, right? But uh, mathematicians and computer scientists like to work with numbers because they know a lot of mathematical functions that can be applied to numbers. And those uh, functions can actually uh, compute the similarity between numbers. And if we apply these, these uh, functions on numbers representing words, we can actually calculate the similarity of words, right? Let's go to the next slide. What we have here is a kind of magic, right? Well, we don't have to actually go through this uh, to, to, with, with a lot of detail, but the main idea is uh, what we have is a corpus at, uh, on the left side of, of, of the picture. That's the input for, for all this me mechanism. You have a corpus in one language, right? So, so preferably a large amount of text, but all in one language. You do some internal operations, right? So you extract the words, you extract the contents, and then you feed it all, feed it all to a neural network. And the neural network produces the numbers so we now know that uh, individual words are represented by some numbers. And these, uh, the numbers that you see, see there are actually the actual representations of, of these words. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so what is, what is it good for, right? So basically uh, this, uh, the vector space is trained on a monolingual corpus and it captures some information about each word. 
So for, uh, for a pair of words, it can assess similarity in, uh, uh, well, that, that can be understood on different levels. It could be semantic similarity, it could be syntactic similarity, like, for example, it's, uh, it can be, uh, it, the vector space can be used to, to, uh, to figure out that the word apparent is, uh, is quite uh, similar to apparently, or possible, impossible, right? Uh, be because the, the, these words are considered similar even though they are antonyms, they, uh, they, are, they are found in, in similar contexts, so, so they, they are considered similar. And many other examples of, of word similarity that you can see on, on, on the slide, it all can be figured out by a vector space. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, but uh, what we need, actually, is not to figure out the similarity between words in a single language. We want to take this concept across languages. We want to, to, to vector space to span across languages. So what we need at first is we need a vector space, separate vector spaces for each language we're working on, right? So we will have a vector space for English, French, Spanish, and also maybe for those less resolved languages, as long as we get a monolingual corpus, we can have a vector space for the, for, for the languages, Tamil, Assamese, Bengali, uh, any, uh, any, any, any language that we can find resources for. Uh, but, um, what we what we have is is like separate vector spaces. Now, in order to compare them, compare words across vector different vector spaces, we have to perform a, an operation of alignment of vector spaces. Let's go to the next slide. Um, now, some more magic, right? Um, um, so, so what, what's most important here is that we actually, we are using a mathematical method of single value decomposition. And the goal of that method is uh, to uh, align two vector spaces. So we have English vector dictionary. So, so we have the English vector space. We have French vector space in this, in this example, right? And then we have an artificial dictionary of homographs, right? Because we observe that some words are uh, uh, present in both vector spaces like London, Paris, John, or so, so we, we are talking about proper names, right? Uh, they appear uh, in both English and French uh, vector spaces. So we use them as an information on how to align, uh, how to align those two vector spaces. What we have is so-called transformation matrix, but I suppose it would be better to show, show it in a, in, in a nicer picture. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, th this in turn is, um, uh, is is an example showing vector space for the English language and vector space for the Italian language. So they are denoted uh, respectively x, y. Uh, so we uh, so each dot represents a word in English vector space and in and in uh, Italian vector space. Uh, now uh, these vector spaces exist separately, right? So they don't have anything uh, in common. Uh, but after the alignment of those vector spaces, let's get to the next slide. Those vector spaces now overlap, and those dots, right? Those 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 dots representing words, uh, well, uh, are now close to each other. So the dot for the English word cat lies close to the dot for the Italian word gatto. Let's go to the next slide. And that uh, basically uh, forms the foundation of the interlanguage vector space. The interlanguage vector space will be a, a huge database of all the vector spaces, but uh, all the vector spaces before they go into the, into the vector space get transformed, get aligned to the English vector space. Uh, the English vector space, because for the English language we have the, the most uh, the, uh, resources, right, for, for, for English vector space. So we treat it as a, as a template model that, that vector space. Uh, so, so we use the English vector space as it is, but all the all, all those other languages get aligned to the English vector space. And from now on, what we can do is we can, uh, we can compute similarity between vectors, which are representing words across languages, right? And we can compare, say, Spanish and Japanese words, or Russian or French, Russian or English words, right? We can, we can do uh, everything uh, that's, uh, that, 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 that basically 
uh, exist in, in the language vector space. So let's go to the next slide. And what we did actually uh, at XTM lately, uh, we, uh, we trained Intel, uh, we trained vector spaces for some of the uh, of the official languages of India, and what we have, uh, uh, what, what I'm presenting right now, are the results. For example, for the language uh, of Gujarati, uh, with a very interesting uh, uh, Brahmic script. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Let's see some other interesting scripts. The, the language Kannada, uh, right? So. Um, and uh, another uh, old Brahmic script, uh, but it, it doesn't stop us, right? Uh, oh yeah, Marathi written with with the Vanagari script. That's uh, that, that, that's one one more language that we can now uh, actually analyze. Right, let's go to the next slide. So this is my final final slide actually. So let me formulate some some conclusions. So uh, first of all, it's not always easy to find language resources for some specific languages, right? Uh, what is uh, what are we most likely to find is a uh, monolingual corpus because that's um, because being able to find texts in one in one language is much easier than finding translations let alone bilingual dictionaries uh, be between the language and, and say English for example right so it's uh, so it's actually um, uh, easiest to, uh, to to get a monolingual corpus um, it's, and once we get a monolingual corpus, that's actually all we need, right? We only need a monolingual corpus for the new language that we want to uh, that we want to analyze. Then we have the interlanguage vector space technology, and we basically offer the support for for this for this new language. And it's now available. The technology is now available in the XTM system. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, that was uh, really uh, done with, 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 uh, with full attention to time. Thank you very much for the presentation. You, we could see the um, some of the mathematics behind behind the how uh, our tools treat the language. We have some interesting questions, and. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just reading them out, and, and let's okay. see what we can what can say to them. Uh, Ibrahim asks, "How does the alignment process work? Who does it, and how long does it take to train a tool to automatically align?" Uh, yeah, very good question. Uh, so the alignment process um, uh, is now well, is, is actually now uh, done uh, with the help of Python scripts. And it's done. Uh, it's not done uh, fully automatically, fully transparently uh, for, for 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 the user. Actually, uh, th this is uh, the kind of kind of process that has to be done by an NLP specialist within our our company. And the specialist basically take, take takes the scripts and performs the single value decomposition with uh, the proper resources, and then analyzes if the results uh, look uh, uh, look nice enough, right? And uh, how long? Uh, it, it, it's not that long. I mean, uh, it's a matter of hours for the whole uh, process. I mean, hours of computer time, right? But uh, takes uh, well, it takes some time for for the specialist to, to set up the process. Thank you very much. Uh, and there's another question here. Uh, Soren says, "Fascinating presentation." I agree with him. Um, question, do loan words occupy the same or very close places in the vector space of the two involved languages? Yeah, I, guess, uh, I guess he means uh, uh, words that were loaned from one language to another and you are looking at these two languages. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. It. Yeah, uh, so uh, the the solution is is the following. Um, uh, what, what what we what, what we do is um, uh, at first we have two separate vector spaces, right? So say for 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 English and and, and French, right? Then um, uh, the, uh, the the words uh, appearing in in, the, in those vector spaces are um, well, I mean the numbers representing the words in those separate vector spaces are completely different at first. Right, because they have no reason to be to be similar, okay? Because they were uh, they, uh, both those vector spaces uh, were were trained on completely different uh, text material. So, like the word London or loan words, also 
uh, they, they are represented by totally different numbers. And then we use the information, we actually use the, the, the structural inf information that the word London in English and the word London, London in French uh, should be the same. We use this information uh, to align the vector spaces. So now those two completely, uh, the, the, these words which are uh, represented by completely different numbers, after the alignment of, of the vector spaces, the, uh, those, those numbers should be, should be the same. So this is why we have the, the alignment of the vector spaces, basically. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. To me, it did, but I also suffer from the curse of knowledge, like as 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 Stephen Pinker would put it. Um, and I I am relaying another question that, that appeared in my chat box. Um, uh, I'm quoting the, the asker. Um, I'm curious what ha hazards exist by keying off of English. If I understood, they use those resourcing almost like a pivot language, so that you, you, meaning that you always have a language model for English, a vector space for English, and then you, you are connect the other languages to this. Uh, so uh, you, you use those resources almost like a pivot language, but is that right? And if so, is that, is that risky in any way? I'm thinking about implicit bias in the language, for example, gender, etc. Uh, and uh, I was also it was also suggested me that I should rephrase that, but I I understood that, so I didn't rephrase in the end. So That's good. right, another good question actually, uh, because uh, and and um, uh, I understand your doubts because uh, actually yes, we are uh, we are arbitrarily let's say choosing English as a pivot yep. language or let's say pivot vector space, right? Yep. Pivot, pivot numbers. Uh, yeah, but uh, what we did actually we checked if it's a good idea. We we uh, we actually made some experiments in which. Uh, when we were analyzing a pair of languages uh, which did not include, uh, include English, actually that was French, Turkish um, uh, language, language pair, we tried to do the alignment directly between French and Turkish. And we were quite surprised that it rendered uh, worse results than doing it uh, via the pivot language of English. It was actually more preferable for the mechanism to have it uh, have French aligned to English and then Turkish to English, and then, uh, then to compare those to French and Turkish, uh, you know, converted into yep. into English, right? So, so that so we actually experimented, and and that's how we know. And we also experimented with um, with with vector spaces uh, trained on different uh, texts, because what we uh, what what we have what we had at first was uh, those uh, which were published by by Facebook. Uh, and they were trained on the whole uh, common crawl corpus. That that's, that's a gigantic, a ginormous corpus of of, of text. And well, uh, the intuition says that uh, it should work best for for for, for all our purposes. But what it um, what showed in our experiments was that, for example, for those uh, Indian languages, uh, it it was it was better to have the English vector space trained on the uh, Wikipedia. Uh, the, 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 we had an option, right? We had an option to, to use uh, s some, some other vectors and we experimented, experimented with it and we decided to go with Wikipedia for that. Uh, thank you. Uh, here's another question that, I, uh, that, I, that occurred to me as well that I would ask, but I don't have to. Do you do any human validation? I can imagine it might be specific, difficult, especially difficult for low-resource low languages but it seems risky to just use automatic metrics. Yes, obviously. Um, uh, what we do, yes, we do, uh, we do, we do perform uh, human evaluation, but we uh, uh, humanly avail evaluate the functionalities uh, that are using uh, this technology. So uh, we, we we don't quite uh, evaluate uh, only the word alignments that that, that we per perform because that's. Well, it's a very tedious task, and that's not very, uh, and it's also not always clear if uh, w what is the, the correct answer, right? So, so um, I'm only aware of uh, a few experiments that uh, in which uh, there, there was created a golden standard for word alignment, right? Uh, what we do actually is we uh, is we validate, we evaluate the final product, which is, for example, in our 
case uh, the automatic aligner of uh, of translation memories in which you, you upload two uh, uh, two files one of one of them is supposed to be the translation of the other and then uh, the 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 alignment comes uh, comes automatically and this aligner is using it in, in the language vector space internally also we have uh, the automatic adjustment of uh, of inline elements of uh, let's say html tags that appear in the translation they are transferred automatically from source to to target and it also uses the information of of in the language vector space and what we do is we evaluate the end product right that that's what makes sense um would you care sharing any uh, uh results pre precision uh results what 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 your experiences were um uh, what we have is a draft um uh, okay. what we are still still working on uh, on, on a very uh, good comprehensive academic uh, publication that that, that would encompass uh, all those all those results that that, that, that we get so um uh, it's it's hard for me to to, to share the exact precision recall uh, okay. figures. All I can say, well, may, maybe th th that will help a little bit. Uh, what, what are the um, the values of similarity between very similar words? So so w when we were experimenting with English and and Italian, so uh, the, the the similarity between cat and gatto was uh, about zero point seven, right? So seventy percent, not a hundred, not nearly a hundred, right? We we never got hundreds. That's because uh, it's all it's all relative. It's all it's it's all flexible and it's it's not that that, that easy with that. We treat zero point seven as a very good indication of uh, of similarity. Similarity. Thank you very much, Rafa. Uh It was a yeah. very enlightening session. Thank you for uh, uh, giving us a glance in behind uh, or under the hood behind the uh, uh, scenes. Uh, we need to move on, but I do look forward to reading your academic publication, obviously. Um, 